if you look into the Book of Mormon, those that were there to greet Jesus Christ at Bountiful at the temple, those that were spared the destructions were those who repented and listened to the prophets. Today, we need to change. Our standards are in the toilet. Our apathy is even worse. But I can promise, and I have a testimony of this, if we will study Jesus Christ's words to realize where are we off, and then if we will be humble enough to recognize and change, be willing to make the change. It's hard. It is so hard. We've come to identify in this culture. We've come to identify with these voices out there that tell us this is who you are and this is okay and and this is what you need to be happy. But if we will trust Jesus Christ, if we will trust these prophets, if we will put our faith in the solutions they've given to us here, Jesus Christ can save us and save our posterity. So Isaiah warns frequently in these chapters, especially these chapters in 2 Nephi that we are reading here, that in the last days, rejection of the Lord is vast, and that if the Lord's people do not repent, they will not be safe and they will not be preserved. How do we change, though, if we don't know what we're doing wrong? How do we correct our course? Well, Isaiah tells us, and that's where we're going to head into next. Now, this podcast is not an Isaiah commentary, and we're focusing primarily on Book of Mormon parallels. And so what we're going to do for the next few minutes is we're going to talk about some of the problems that Isaiah points out, but specifically how Mormon actually puts those same concerns and those same warnings in the Book of Mormon narrative and the history of the Nephite nation so that we don't have to just read Isaiah and try to sift through all the poetic language that can sometimes be hard to get through. Um, We don't just have Isaiah. We actually have the Book of Mormon, the Nephite history, and Mormon actually puts all of those warnings in there so you can actually read the story of the Nephites to get the same warnings. The beautiful thing about the Book of Mormon is that it speaks in plainness. And as you go through, you're going to see that Mormon calls out the same issues Isaiah does. So in 2 Nephi chapter 12, verses 6 through 12, the point is brought out that the Lord's people struggle with wealth and a lot of pride in the last days. Quote, Therefore, O Lord, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, Their land also is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots, right? They're very wealthy. And you can actually see this in the last days. You know, when the pioneers came out to Utah, they were poor, they were impoverished. But very quickly, they became a mighty and a wealthy people as they began spreading out throughout the earth. But Isaiah says, instead of using that wealth to serve the poor and to do good, Instead, it's used for themselves and it's built to to build up our own pride and our own self-esteem and our own glory. And the Lord is not happy about this. And we see this in the Book of Mormon. If you go throughout the Book of Mormon, the Nephites are continually being chastised and warned about their love of riches and their love of wealth and, and this pride that it builds. I think that's enough said. I think we can all understand what he's talking about there. So let's move on to the next uh, warning that Isaiah gives. In 2 Nephi chapter 15, verses 12 through 13, the Lord warns about removing God from our worldview, from our culture, uh, even from our education. He says, quote, They regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst, end quote. Now, what does he mean they regard not the work of the Lord, that they consider not the operation of his hands? Could this be referring to this secularism in our day, this desire to take God out and take out acknowledgement of his hand? We actually see this foreshadowed in the Book of Mormon. So in the Book of Mormon, you have King Noah's priests, um, and they set up an education system among the Lamanites. 
And it's very interesting that Mormon points out a specific detail about this education system. He says that it caused them to become very educated and increase in riches, that they began to be a cunning and a wise people as to the wisdom of the world. The education was amazing. But Mormon points out something very interesting about this education system that was set up by King Noah's priests. It says in Mosiah 24, 5, that they were a people that were friendly with one another, but they knew not God, and neither did the brethren of Amulon teach them anything concerning the Lord their God, neither the law of Moses, nor did they teach them the words of Abinadi, end quote. In other words, it goes on to talk about how they taught them how to write, how to keep records, and they became very increased in riches and very wise and cunning as to the wisdom of the world, but God was not included in their education. And of course, we can see in Doctrine and Covenants that the Lord is not happy about this. This is in section 59, verse 21. The Lord says, And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, Save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments, end quote. In other words, we see in the Book of Mormon and we see warnings from the Lord in the Doctrine and Covenants where he says, you cannot teach and you cannot build a civilization. You cannot build an education system where God has been removed. In Lesson 3, we talked about President McKay and President Hinckley and President Packer warning about when God was removed out of the American public education system. They said this is very wrong and this will lead to the downfall of the nation. And you can see Mormon warning about that in Mosiah, in the book of Mosiah. And then you see Isaiah, I would submit, saying, warning, the Latter-day Saints. He's saying, are you regarding the work of the Lord? Are you considering the operation of his hands? Well, now you're not, and you're going into captivity because you don't have that knowledge of God. And much of what we see happening in the United States today in our government, in our society, um, in the movements where marriage and uh, family and children are concerned, we are seeing the principles of secular humanism that state that it is man that is predominant rather than God and the words of God that are predominant. There are those in this nation today who would delete all of this reference to deity. They would take it out of the Pledge of Allegiance. They would take it from our coinage. They would remove it from our, any mention in our national life. Mr. Speaker, on April 6th of this year, the President of the United States traveled halfway around the globe and in the nation of Turkey essentially proclaimed that the United States was not a Judeo-Christian nation. We do not consider ourselves a Christian nation or a Jewish nation or a Muslim nation. Uh, we consider ourselves uh, a nation of citizens. The first question was whether or not we ever considered ourselves a Judeo-Christian nation. And the second one is if we did, what was that moment in time where we ceased to be so? And we look at what is going on in removing the Ten Commandments from public areas in removing God, in not being able to pray at commencement or pray at a, a football game or a basketball game. When Mrs. Margaret Thatcher was on this campus and I was talking with her, she said, I cannot understand it. You have the motto, in God we trust on your coinage, and yet you cannot mention the name of deity in the classrooms of your schools. She wondered, and I wonder about our consistency. Freedom is only available to people who are moral. We hear that all of the way through the Book of Mormon. And so today, uh, the prophets are, are warning us to really sit up and, and take notice and stand to defend our rights. Religion is being driven from the public square. Are we so arrogant as to believe that we can get along without him? We see the manifestation of that arrogance in the great host of social problems with which we deal these days. In 2 Nephi 17, um, Isaiah and Nephi, they talk about the dangers of 
separating God and the secularization because it results in trusting in man and the alliances of man to save us. This is whether this is political or personal, it's this very modern contemporary idea, you know, the gospel is not enough to solve our problems. You know, the gospel can help to heal addiction. It can help our marriages. It can help our society, but it's not enough. We also need these alliances with this or that expert. We also need this or that um, secular ideology or philosophy or alliance, political alliance. And Isaiah hits this so hard. Notice this. When you're reading these passages and these chapters, he warns over and over and over. In 2 Nephi 18, he talks about, do not put trust in everyone else's plan of safety. There's going to be so many people out there saying, I have the solution. This will work. Just This is a no-fail plan of a protection. And he says, don't trust it. It's not going to work and it's not going to save you. And if you think about our society today and our statistics and our rapid decline, it's almost the more we trust in these solutions, the more we struggle and the more our statistics speak for themselves. Isaiah warns us of this. The Book of Mormon warns us of this. This is a warning for Latter-day Saints in our day. Isaiah also talks about the destruction of masculinity and fathers. In 2 Nephi chapter 13, verse 12, he says, And my people... Children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they who lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. President Benson specifically commented on this prophecy of Isaiah when he said, quote, The undermining of the home and family is on the increase, with the devil anxiously working to displace the father as the head of the home, and create rebellion among the children. The Book of Mormon describes this condition when it states, And my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. End quote. Definitely maybe not the most politically correct or popular comment for President Benson to make, but one that is very needed in our day. This is just a short clip that was put together showing the portrayal of fatherhood and masculinity in our day and how that in our media, in our books, we have become accustomed to this destruction of masculinity. Father knows best? Well, if you've been watching any TV of late, you wouldn't think so. Our Father's Day cover story is reported by Russ Mitchell. So you want me to go to college? College? <laughs> Barbara Clown. Bart! How would you feel if you suddenly found out you were adopted and that wasn't your real dad? Dad, don't say that. Unless you're absolutely positive it's true. Don't bother changing the channel. They're everywhere. I can't reach it. Dad, you have to come up another rung. My ears are popping. He's lazy. He's immature. He's stupid. He's a, a, a marginal at best father. You know, his daughter has no respect for him. Which is why not everybody hey, loves doing? Raymond. Grandma's helping me with my homework. Oh. Want me to help? That's her idea. We're working on grammar right now. <laughs> Can I ask you something, Ray? His wife is the one who's smart well, and makes all the decisions and yeah! kind of uh, uh, leads him around. This is what we do. It's called being a parent. Well, maybe I don't want to be called that. <laughs> That's the modern dad. Do you think if uh, someone came here from, from another planet and mm -hmm. watched American TV, they would think all dads were doofuses? Absolutely. It would be worse than doofuses. <laughs> they would think that maybe good child development was overcoming the stupidity of the dad. Let's see. List your three favorite books and how they've influenced your life. Is TV Guide a book? No. Son of Sniglet? No. Catherine Hepburn's Me? No. Oh, I suck. And according to Warren Farrell, author of Father and Child Reunion, this negative image of American dads is beginning to take its toll. There's a tremendous amount of uh, feeling of being like Willie Loman, or, and as, as Rodney Dangerfield would say, you know, I, I don't get no respect. Look how fast that is. So it's kind of encyclopedia-ish. Sachs argues this dad is a doofus image is being sold to America in any number of ways. Yes. Take a look at this Verizon commercial. Uh, she's working on a school project, I'm kind of... She's eight years uh, old. Tom, leave her alone. She's already smarter than dad, of course. Tom! She's just like, you know, totally contemptuous of him. 
and then uh, gives her mother this look like, get this idiot out of here. But his war goes on. Again, the negative images of men and fathers. I mean, you look at some of these books here. Uh, Dad has bad manners, just like the kids do. do. And mom has to scold all three of them. Is he cleaning out his teeth uh, with a twig there, God it looks like? What. Well, you know, I think, I think it's been a, a long and honored television tradition, at least over the last 20 years, that the fathers tend to be the ones who were screwing things up and causing uh, problems for the mothers, who if the kids would be just left with their mothers would be just fine. If you want to dive in a little bit further, I really recommend this amazing talk called Hollywood's Most Despised Villain. We're including it in the resources for Lesson 9. You can go there and you can listen to it. And it's a talk given by a man named Jeff Botkin who talks about he documents the attack, the coordinated attack that was done in the 1900s by socialists, communists, and even very influential people in Hollywood to specifically destroy the father. Why? Because their ultimate goal was to destroy America, to take America over. But the more they tried, they kept running into this problem. Christianity and Christians and the churches kept pushing against them and thwarting every attempt they had to take America over. And so they got together and they met and they said, how are we going to do this? How do we take out Christianity? And after meeting and experimenting, they came down to a silver bullet way to take out God and take out Christianity in America. And what they came up with was their most despised villain, as the title says, the father. Jesus Christ, his kingdom and his followers have dedicated serious enemies. Many of you have no idea how dedicated and how serious your enemies are in the neo-Marxist world. And as a, Mar as a former Marxist, I understand this. And I was a Christian hater. And the Lord was merciful to me. I was a violent Christian hater. And well, it's, it's even hard for me to even recall some of the things that we used to talk about in meetings that we'd have. I mean, we saw no no useful purpose for Christians in society. And we were literally talking about, well, what could we do, you know, for the glory of the state, for good old Mother Earth? Christians would make good fertilizer. Serious discussion. And I'm ashamed to say it. Christ's enemies have used carnal aesthetics to replace Christian civilization with socialistic statism. It's a fact. These are our conclusions. Next one. They have used the feature film as a primary weapon to make unholy, antithetical aesthetics the accepted structure of our post-Christian culture. The accepted structure. So they began a coordinated attack. We're talking about in the 1900s with black and white movies. And, and he walks through, Jeff Bakken just does such a good job walking through the history. It's very eye-opening. I highly recommend it. And what you'll walk away realizing is, yes, Isaiah knew our day. He knew exactly what he was talking about. And he's warning us that we need to become aware and we need to fix this problem in our day. The Book of Mormon actually does a very good job at doing this. It doesn't just point out the problem. You know, some of these other things like the wealth, the pride, the witchcraft. Um, Mormon just says, hey, this is going on. Fix it. Come on, guys. Let's get our act together. But when it comes to fatherhood, he does something a little bit differently. He includes all of the solutions. And if you look at the Book of Mormon, you see over and over and over. We've talked about this before amazing examples of what real masculinity and real fatherhood looks like. Why is he doing that? He's doing that because he looked at our day and realized, guys, this is going to be an issue you are struggling with. Here, let me give you solutions. And then not only the Book of Mormon, but this is where I again go back to Latter-day Prophets. I'm so grateful for so many of their teachings. Uh, this is President Benson when he said, quote, in a real Latter-day Saint home, there is no such thing as a generation gap. We never heard of it until a few years ago. And where did it start? It started with some of these so-called social reformers, these do-gooders who are used as tools of the adversary to drive young people away from their parents and to get parents to let down in their responsibility to give guidance and direction to their own children, end quote. 
keep President Benson's words in mind if you go listen to Hollywood's most despised villain, because President Benson is literally commenting on the research and the historical evidence that Jeff Botkin points out. And President Benson is saying, this is not necessary. This is not normal. We're used to it today. We're used to these teenagers and rebellion and this generation gap, as he describes it. But he says, this actually isn't normal and we need to fix this. President Kimball also gave a testimony where he explained that we could fix so many problems in our day with a criminal behavior, worldliness, um, immorality, crime, if we would turn back and reinstate true fatherhood and masculinity in our culture. This is what he said, quote, the spirit of the times is worldliness. Supposedly, good youth from recognized good families express their revolt in destructive acts. Respect for authority, secular, religious, political, seems to be at a low ebb. Immorality, drug addiction, general moral and spiritual deterioration seems to be increasing and the world is in turmoil. But the Lord has offered an old program in New Dress and it gives the promise to return the world to sane living, to true family life, to family interdependence. It is to return the father to his rightful place at the head of the family, to bring mother home from social life and employment, the children from near total fun and frolic, end quote. That comes from an excellent talk called Home Training, The Cure for Evil by President Spencer W. Kimball. Again, these are prophets of God trying to give us hope and to give us answers. And that's what I want you to focus on. Not blame and guilt and oh, we're doing, you're doing so much worse than you think, but just recognizing someone saying, you know what? This may not be the wisest course to take. Let's fix it. And here's the solution. And let's focus on those solutions. Isaiah also warns about the increase of witchcraft in 2 Nephi chapter 18, 19. And also the Book of Mormon. In Mormon chapter 1 and Alma 1, it warns about this increase of witchcraft and sorcery in the culture. If you look at our day, if you look at new methods of healing, you look at our entertainment, um, we have a continual increase over the last several decades in a turn to witchcraft. Whether occult books, movies, Harry Potter, um, variations and forms that are used as healing methods. And Isaiah warns about this. He says, you are turning to witchcraft. Don't do it. It's not a game. And God says in these Isaiah chapters, he says, if you do this, you are actually breaking your covenants. You will be destroyed. President Joseph F. Smith added his own witness to this when he said, quote, witchcraft and all kindred evils are solely the creations of the superstitious imaginations of men and women who are steeped in ignorance and derive their power over people from the devil. And those who submit to his influence are deceived by him. Unless they repent, they will be destroyed. There is absolutely no possibility for a person who enjoys the Holy Spirit of God even to believe that such influences can have any effect upon him. The enjoyment of the Holy Spirit is absolute proof against all influences of evil. You never can obtain that spirit by seeking diviners and men and women who peep and mutter. As a book series, its success is downright supernatural, selling more than 100 million copies worldwide. As a movie, it's smashing records and captivating kids of all ages. CBN News explores the mystery behind Harry Potter mania. It seems just about everyone is reading the Potter books or lining up to see the movie, but some folks don't think the young wizard is the example they'd like for their children. You know, there are a lot of people out there right now who are saying, oh, here go those Christians again. <laughs> you know, they're on another soapbox. Why should Christian parents be concerned about a, a film that's being sort of touted as harmless? Well, first of all, let's see what Warner Brothers says about the film. Warner Brothers says that it's an accurate portrayal of witchcraft. So here we have witches across the nation endorsing Harry Potter, saying that more than any other time that Harry Potter has initiated such response to witchcraft that witches now have schools of witchcraft on the internet where children can come, be graduated into, get certificates of graduation to become witches. And of course, the books have been promoted by Scholastic Inc 
who have been the providers of curriculum for 80 years in public schools. So here, where religion, where Christianity has been taken out of the schools, or all religion indeed, here we have a wizard, Harry Potter, a witch, who goes to school with 350 other students to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, which has been repackaged as a reading incentive program promoted by Scholastic Inc., the publishers, in our schools, 32 million children a year are being reached by witchcraft repackaged. And J.K. Rowling herself, who is the author, says that she took more than a third of the research and the content of these so-called fantasy books from occult research. So she has drawn from history. She has drawn from mythology. She admits that she has drawn from the religions of uh, Celtic, Druidic, Satanic, Wiccan, pagan roots and written them into her fiction books for children. Taylor Swift is one of the most popular pop singers of our day. People have been experiencing amnesia going to her concerts. Her views on karma as well as family and marriage are extremely troubling. But one of the things that I'm going to highlight in this video is also things that come from her Willow video song that deals with spells and witchcraft. But you know, Jenny, it's so troubling to see that witchcraft and the occult uh, is really on the rise. I mean, we're seeing it in stores. We're seeing clothing promoting, hey, I'm a good witch or I'm a bad witch, you know. Right. Uh, we're seeing uh, even witches having workshops and retreats and all these things. Why do you think this has become so much more mainstream, so much more acceptable? I think media has done a, a, a good job of pushing something to the point where it is now normalized. When back in the day, something like that for you and I, it would be shocking to see. And now because we have shows as early as, you know, daycare age, promoting witchcraft and sorcery, and it's okay, boys and girls, say these spell words with us. And it's so ABC preschool witchcraft that it gets into the hearts and the minds of people, including the people in church and people who are, are not really connected with the Lord and don't understand. They're easily deceived. And the Bible talks about even the very elect will be deceived. And so people are going to a whole nother source. Now, when we chose the title for this podcast, we used the subtitle Hard Truth and answers. And I'm going to fully acknowledge some of these uh, comments that I'm making, some of these scriptures, they may be hard to hear. They may prick our conscience. But I would plead with you that these prophets were prophets of God, that they knew what they were talking about. Isaiah saw us. He saw you. He saw me. He saw what we were struggling with and he saw why we were being destroyed as a people, why our society is falling apart. And so often I think we can look around and say, why am I struggling? Why do we have marriages falling apart and children rebelling and depression and anxiety on the rise? Why is this happening? Because we're trying our best. But that's because too often we don't realize what we've become accustomed to, what we've grown up in our culture. We're used to seeing magic and the occult become very prominent places in our movies, in our books, in our entertainment. And it's fine. Books are written by Latter-day Saints that include these things. They're sold at popular Latter-day Saint bookstores. But if we turn to the prophets, they're saying, okay, you've become accustomed to this because it's in your culture, but actually... God is not okay with this, and it is contributing to the downfall of your culture. Will you listen? Will you hear what we have to say? Will you hear us crying from the dust? And will you repent and turn back? We all can do better. We must do better. One thought to consider as we talk about this issue that Isaiah is bringing up is the fact that we are seeing within the church today the development of a new narrative regarding our church history and Joseph Smith that puts Joseph Smith as someone who actually dabbled in the occult himself. We see this in books including Rough Stone Rolling and other popular materials, and a lot of youth and a lot of Latter-day Saints are struggling with this new narrative. 
many are leaving the church because of it. It's this new idea that, oh, you know what, Joseph Smith, all growing up and his father and his family, that they were treasure diggers and they were involved in, they did rituals and and folk magic. And it's very fascinating to me that Isaiah warns that in the last days, the Latter-day Saints would struggle with this. The Lord's people would struggle with a compromising on the standard between witchcraft and the priesthood. And then we actually see that narrative coming in to reinterpret our church history and our youth are struggling. Are our youth struggling because they've become so accustomed to this culture where witchcraft is normalized? Is this actually leading and maybe one of the contributing factors, the fact that we have such a great faith crisis going on today? These are just questions that I would encourage you to just be willing to consider, to think about, and really ponder as you read Isaiah's warnings. And remember that Isaiah is doing this out of love. He loves us. He loves the Latter-day Saints, and he wants to see us succeed. He doesn't want to see us destroyed as a people. He wants us to build Zion. And so he's trying to, with love, highlight, guys, this is where you're getting off. I believe that if we will turn back to the teachings of the prophets, if we will take Isaiah's warnings to heart, we will be able to restore and rebuild because we need to restore and rebuild. Isaiah talks about how in our day, there are no great leaders and heroes. This is in 2 Nephi chapter 13, 2 through 4. And again, remember, the Lord is talking to the saints. He talks about the Lord of hosts doth take away the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. He says, I'm taking all of those away. I'm taking away your great heroes, your great men, and I will give children unto them to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them, end quote. Remember, he's not talking about, uh, he's not decrying age here. He's not saying, oh, if you're six or eight or 10, you know, you're a loser. Mormon was 10 when he's given the responsibility of taking care of the plates. Mormon's 16 when he's given command of the armies. God isn't decrying age. He's using more of a description of the character capacity, the, the level of intelligence that the leaders we have today in our society are. He's saying they're not great men. They're not amazing. They are literally children and babies. And if you think this is too harsh, President Hinckley gave a very interesting statement affirming this and saying that he noticed the same problem in his day. He said, quote, I respect all men, and it is from disrespect for none that I say there are no great leaders in the world today. In fact, greatness itself is laughed to scorn. You should not be great today. You should sink yourself into the herd. You should not be distinguished from the crowd. You should simply be one of the many. The commanding voice is lacking. The voice which speaks little, but which when it speaks, it speaks with compelling moral authority. This kind of voice is not congenial to this age. The age flattens and levels down every distinction into drab uniformity. Respect for the high, the noble, the great, the rare, the specimen that appears once every hundred or every thousand years is gone. Respect at all is gone. If you ask people whom and what people do respect, the answer is literally nobody and nothing. This is simply an unrespecting age. It is the age of utter mediocrity. If you read Isaiah, President Hinckley sounds like he's quoting Isaiah and they're of the same mind and the same voice. Uh, President Hinckley continues, he says, To become a leader today, even a mediocre leader, is a most uphill struggle. You are constantly in every way and from every side pulled down. One wonders who of those living today will be remembered a thousand years from now. If you believe in prayer, my friends, and I know that you do, then pray that God send great leaders, especially great leaders of the Spirit, end quote. Brothers and sisters, today we are in a state of wickedness. There's no other way to say it. We are in a state of degeneration, and our society is bearing the consequences. We are falling apart. 
Over the last few years, uh, dating from when this podcast was recorded in 2024, we've seen a number of blood moons and eclipses, and there's been so much discussion and debate. What are these about? Brothers and sisters, this is about us. These warnings are for us. Yes, those warnings God wants to give also to the non-members, to the Jews, but the most important people the Lord is concerned about are those who are making covenants with him, those who claim to be the Lord's people. And Isaiah warns that the Lord's people in our day are rejecting him. If you go read Isaiah in 2 Nephi 16 and 17, though, he gives a solution. He explains that there is going to be a small remnant that comes back and listens. This is Isaiah's call. This is Mormon's call. And this is the call, really, of this podcast. Look back. It is time to repent. It's time to go back. And we can do this. We have the solutions. In 2 Nephi chapter 17, it talks about how Jesus Christ is that sign. He is that solution. And he will teach us how to discern. We're all growing up really in trash and garbage, and we have to pull ourselves out and it will be hard. But Jesus Christ will step in to help us on that journey. It's going to be rough. You know what? There was persecution in the Nephites days. There were Nephite prophets that were put to death, but it will be worth it and a remnant will be able to rebuild. The final call that Nephi and Isaiah really have, and if you go into 2 Nephi 19, this is, it's really the clearest, is that Jesus Christ is the way. It's this beautiful promise. He can break every yoke, these captive chains that we have around us, both in our personal lives, as a society. He can break all of them. He is the one with the good government. He has the word, the real pure word. And over and over and over in these chapters, as Isaiah is saying, and, and obviously he's quoting the Lord, it's the Lord speaking, but Isaiah's prophecies, as he's saying, and you have this problem, and you have this, and you've rebelled this way, and this, and you have this problem, and you're doing this wrong. Over and over and over again, though, he always follows it up with, and yet my hand is stretched out still. In other words, I know you're struggling, but I'm right here to help you. If you look into the Book of Mormon, those that were there to greet Jesus Christ at Bountiful at the temple those that were spared the destructions were those who repented and listened to the prophets. Today, we need to change. Our standards are in the toilet. Our apathy is even worse. But I can promise, and I have a testimony of this, if we will study Jesus Christ's words to realize where are we off, and then if we will be humble enough to recognize and change, be willing to make the change. It's hard. It is so hard. We've come to identify in this culture. We've come to identify with these voices out there that tell us this is who you are and this is okay and, and this is what you need to be happy. But if we will trust Jesus Christ, if we will trust these prophets, if we will put our faith in the solutions they've given to us here, Jesus Christ can save us and save our posterity.